Well, for such a uh, brief little lesson this week, it's certainly taken me long enough to uh, be able to upload this. Please uh, uh, accept my apologies on that. But um, short lesson this week, we're just going to deal with a few selections here. We're going to pick up where we left off um, with the Halfway Covenant and those kinds of things. Uh, the general theme here is spiritual journey in some respects, or maybe journeys in general, spiritual, secular, and otherwise. But what we're taking a look at in this particular lesson this week are three very short selections from people who were writing prose in the, la in the later Puritan era. We're talking here the very late 1600s and early 1700s, because what we want to do is contrast that with the kinds of writings, the kinds of thinking, the kind of social climate that was existing uh, in that first generation or two of the Puritan era in New England. Uh, so we're going to be, beginning with, we're going to be uh, beginning with Solomon Stoddard's work, an answer in some cases of conscience. And a few things about Solomon Stoddard. The text itself is kind of pretty uh, cut and dried here. There's not an awful lot to go through. But he is a very important figure for a few reasons. Number one, he was the chief architect of the Halfway Covenant that we talked about in the last uh, lesson. And uh, that's very important because uh, the, the halfway covenant was was a sort of forced compromise that took place. I mean, nobody who was who was um, uh, voting in favor of it at the time was all that enthusiastic, except for Stoddard. Stoddard actually thought it was a great idea. Most people thought it was an, a necessary evil, and they kind of swallowed hard and did it anyway. A few things interesting about Stoddard. Stoddard was the grandfather of Jonathan Edwards, someone we're going to run into here in a couple of weeks, and he was the one who during the Puritan era espoused what I would consider to be a comparatively liberal theology compared to his peers, especially regarding communion. I mean, at one point, Stoddard didn't just believe in the halfway covenant for members and the children of members. He actually opened up communion to anybody who wanted to walk into the church. That was incredibly, not just liberal, but radical. He was very much opposed by the Mathers, Cotton Mather and Increase Mather, uh, two powerhouse guys, scholars and ministers uh, during that period who would have been considered staunch conservatives on issues of theology. And uh, so Stoddard was considered quite a radical guy. And he was the grandfather of Jonathan Edwards. In a few weeks, like I said, we'll see what Edwards does with that. But the fact of the matter is that Stoddard really believed that the church in New England, we're talking about the Puritan church, uh, needed basically to branch out, or it was going to die on the vine. Um, by the time Stoddard comes along, uh, they've uh, begun to change the name of the church. They no longer refer to themselves as Puritans. They call themselves Congregationalists. We'll get to that later as well. Um, but ultimately, Sod Solomon Stoddard's views, though they were seen as being quite radical and they were opposed vigorously by a number of people within mainline Puritanism, ultimately many of his views largely won out. Not everything, but many of them did. Did they do an awful lot to increase membership or increase loyalty to uh, Puritanism in New England? No, not particularly. But they were uh, eventually seen as being somewhat less radical uh, as well. Now, one of the ways, and this is a biggie, probably bigger than communion in my book, uh, was that he took on this notion that no one could be certain of salvation. You know, we talked about that, my famous analogy of everybody in this class has a grade and it's inside of an envelope and you don't know what it is until we open the envelopes at the very end. And you can sort of kind of try to figure out, am I or am I not going to get an A in the class? Uh, you know, what's my, my grade eternal state? Um, and so uh, that sort of thing, we're going to see that in the poetry when we get to Anne Bradstreet and whatnot. You see it in a lot of different sort of venues. It's one of the reasons why Puritans wrote diaries so much, because they were always, always, always examining the state of their salvation throughout their lives. Stoddard is the one who says, no, you don't need to do that. You can be certain of your salvation if you do what uh, is asked of you in the New Testament scriptures uh, and you follow Jesus' injunctions then you don't have to wonder about your salvation all your life. Um, this was a really radical thing. This is very much a huge departure, not just from Puritanism, but the Calvinist view that Puritanism was based on, you see. So he strikes straight at the heart of Calvinism. Uh, and it won't be long after Solomon started that a left, or, a left wing um, uh, portion of the Puritan uh, church will begin to question other aspects of basic Calvinist doctrine, like the doctrine of election and these kinds of things. But that's coming way, way later. Now, in this work, a couple of things that are important. One is some rather humorous, uh, and by the way, the excerpt here is doesn't, doesn't sort of do it justice, I'm afraid. But he takes on certain fashions as being inappropriate. Uh, men had 
taken to wearing wigs at this point, um, powdered wigs, those kinds of things. Women had begun to wear hoop skirts. He's not too fond of this. Um, he says uh, uh, on page uh, 454, um, the custom doth now prevail among pious people, but it seems utterly unlawful to wear their hair long. It is a great burden and cumber. It is effeminacy and a vast expense. He doesn't think that wigs or long hair is a good idea. You remember the the Puritans were nicknamed roundheads because they had Old Testament injunctions against wearing your hair long. Um, well, good heavens, if uh, Solomon Stoddard thinks that wearing your hair longer, as, as a man, by the way, or wigs for men, or w women making too much of a fuss of their, uh, of their hairdos, and Solomon Stoddard was relatively liberal on some things, you can only imagine how these new fashions and trends in New England had to have convinced the church hierarchy, the mainstream guys, the conservative fellows, that, oh gosh, all of New England is going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, we're importing all these fripperies and, and gugaws and, and fad things. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's probably the equivalent, uh, uh, 17th century equivalent of um, uh, young, win, young men uh, wearing their pants too low in, in this day and age, I guess. Um, so he goes on about that and women's hoop skirts. And, uh, but the, the, the basis doesn't seem to be that he thinks that those kinds of things are immoral or um, sexually inappropriate or anything like that. It's that the, it's the expense. It's the van of it. Um, it's, it's, it's the wastefulness and the, and, the, and the silliness of it. It makes you look like an idiot. Um, and that's probably true of all times for all kinds of faddish fashions, I suppose. What is probably most interesting here on page 457 is his defense of the way the colonists over the course of some almost 100 years, treated the Native Americans in New England. And this is an interesting thing. Question 8. Did we any wrong to the Indians by buying their land at a small price? And he gives several answers in good old-fashioned organized Puritan form. It would read just like a sermon almost. It's not, though. Um, well, answer 1. There was some part of the land that was not purchased, neither was there need that it should. It was vacuum domicilium, and so, meaning nobody lived there. Um, and so might be possessed by virtue of God's grant to mankind. Uh, Genesis 1, 28. See, he got, cites the scripture, good for you, right? Went to good old uh, theology school there as a Puritan, so he knows how to make an argument. Uh, the Indians made no use of it, but for hunting. As someone who's a hunter-gatherer, you, you might take objection to that and say, yeah, well, that's kind of the hunter part of my hunter-gathering lifestyle, so it's kind of important to us. Uh, but they see it as, uh, all they we're doing is using it for hunting. Uh, yeah, that's how we eat. Um, but God's but God's first grant, uh, by God's first grant, men were to subdue the earth, okay? So there's a, see, you see, he says, we're, we're not supposed to let it go wild. We're supposed to subdue it. We're supposed to plant. We're supposed to harvest. We're supposed to, you know, live an agrarian lifestyle. These people are wasting the land, you see. Uh, skip down to answer number three. Though we gave but a small price for what we bought, we gave them their demands, we came to their market and gave them their price. And indeed, it was worth but little. In other words, this was undeveloped land. It's not worth that much. Secondly, we gave them what they asked. They wanted some money. We gave them some money. Um, and had it continued in their hands, it would never have been of, it, it would have been of little value. It is our dwelling on it and our improvements that have made it to be of worth. Now, that is an actually a fairly interesting argument. It's a, it's a good argument. Um, don't know if don't know if it carries the day, but uh, certainly uh, the land is worth what the land is worth in very large measure because somebody develops it. Otherwise, it's just this wilderness that's, you know, a lot of hard work in front of you from their perspective. From the perspective of a hunter-gatherer society, well, that is a vast wilderness of immense importance and of intrinsic wealth wealth in terms of its beauty, in terms of its bounty, in terms of uh, fauna, not just flora. So what, what, I'm, what I'm pointing that out for is Stoddard being fairly open-minded guy, fairly liberal fellow when it comes to this sort of stuff, still took a fairly um, um, uh, straightforward party line answer on, no, we were entitled to this property. We gave them what they asked for. A lot of it they didn't even really own. Um, and it was being wasted, and we made it valuable. While it was in their hands, it wasn't being used. So regardless of how you feel about that argument, you can see that there is at least um, a case to be made uh, on the part of the Puritans. Whether the case carries the day, well, that's another story.